It is so good to look you in the eyes. You can still do that with a face mask on and feel as if um, we are connected. Human presence really matters, and I think we all have a greater appreciation of that. Um, but also, I'm so thankful for technology because it means that we can stay connected. So if you're tuning in online, thank you. And I have um, a, a little giveaway just for those who are tuning in online this morning. And uh, I want to introduce these uh, two books here by Russell Moore. Uh, by the way of five words that I think of when I think of Russell Moore. Russell Moore is the president of the ERLC, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, uh, which is a, a kind of a, a really a kind of political arm of the Southern Baptist Church. And Russell Moore is one of the wisest, um, gentlest, and frankly, bravest men that I know. And everything that he writes is good. If it has his name on it, you can buy it and it's totally worth it. But I wanna give away two books, one, Tempted and Tried uh, by Russell Moore, Temptation and the Triumph of Christ, and another, The Storm-Tossed Family. Now, I'm gonna guess that this is gonna be good for a lot of us families coming out of quarantine who have a healthy sense now of what the true state of things really are. Um, and here's how we're gonna do this. If you're tuning in online, then Pastor Scott is monitoring the message uh, board there, and if you can, uh, guess the number between one and a hundred that Scott has in his mind right now, then we will mail these books to you. Um, and you're going to love this. Okay. Um, our text this morning, we're continuing in, continuing in our series in John's uh, Gospel, chapters 13 to 17, with John chapter 16, verses 8 to 15. I'm going to read 4 to 15, though. Uh, last week, we looked mainly at verses 6 and 7. Uh, today, we're going to zero in on verses 8 to 15. Let's read those together. John chapter 16, beginning of verse 4. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is God's word. Now, last week in our one-point sermon, we let Jesus convince us that it is actually more advantageous for us that he has gone to heaven by way of the cross and sent down the Holy Spirit. It's hard for us to believe because we're amazed by Jesus and how could it possibly be to our advantage that he would go to heaven and we would be still here on earth? Well, you have to look at last week's sermon to see that it actually is because the Holy Spirit is Christ in us. The Holy Spirit, I'm going to guess though, despite the fact that Jesus says we're in a more advantageous now position now because of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to guess that still for many of us, that is still for many Christians, the Holy Spirit is, is the least 
formed uh, category in our mind for God. And we kind of know what to do with the Father. We know what to do with the Son. But when it comes to the Spirit, you know, we, we, we're not quite so sure. Um, a few weeks ago, I was putting my, my kids to bed. And I don't know if any of you kids in the room do this um, to your parents, but my kids are really good at coming up with reasons not to go to bed just yet. And the things that come into their mind are of the most intense and astute theological nature right before bedtime because I think they figured out that's what keeps daddy talking. Um, I said to, after many excuses, I said, okay, it's time to go to bed. And, um, but you know, all your worries that you've just been expressing, don't worry, God will be with you while you sleep. And just as I was about to turn out the lights, my oldest daughter, she snuck one in. It was a good question. She said, but daddy, how will God be with us? And you know, I couldn't turn the light off on that question. So I said, baby, the Spirit of God will be with you in the room as you sleep. And as I said it, the look that came over her face was basically a look of terror. And it occurred to me that basically what she had heard me say was, someone you cannot see will be watching you all night while you sleep. Good night. Um, so quickly I reeled it in. I said to her, uh, love, you, you trust Jesus, don't you? Yeah, Daddy. You know that Jesus died for you and he loves you. He would never hurt you. Yeah, Daddy. Well, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. And a look of comfort came over her face. Why? Because she knows how to reason from Jesus to the Spirit. And that's just what Jesus wants us to do. Notice that there are seven I, or he wills in this verse. So, I mean, clearly these verses, uh, 8 to 15, are not about what we do. They're about what he will do. Jesus says seven times he will. But there's one in verse 14, I, I believe it is. There's one, I'm sorry, 13, he will not. Seven he wills, one he will not. What is it? In other words, when Jesus wants to comfort us and encourage us that the Holy Spirit is, is for us, that we're more in a more advantageous position, he doesn't just tell us what the Holy Spirit will do. He tells us also what the Holy Spirit will not do. Isn't that amazing? He will not, verse 13, speak on his own authority. Guys, the Spirit of God has his own authority. He's God. The Spirit is no less God than the Son or than the Father. But when it comes to the care of the church, the Spirit is like the telephone line between us and Jesus. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't interject things that, that are, are from his own authority. He speaks what he hears from Jesus. In other words, the Spirit is not a rogue spirit. The Spirit did not come to um, set up a church of the Spirit, but to empower, sustain, and continue the ministry of Christ in the world. So I have basically one point to drive home this morning, and that is that the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is a Christ-centered ministry, but I also want to tease that out with, with two sub-points, which means that I have three points, but it's one point with two sub-points, so it's not really my normal three-point sermon. He, here's my first point. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is Christ-centered. Now, maybe you think, well, yeah, I mean, duh, but guys, as we look around the world today, can we really say that, that, that it's, that's always the case in every church? That it's obvious that the ministry of the Spirit is a Christ-centered ministry? Are there not some churches who are trying to use the Spirit for something other than exalting Jesus Christ? Number one, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is Christ-centered. And the follow-on thought, he is as active today as ever before. All right? Look at verse 14 with me. The four, I think, most important words in the entire Bible for understanding the Holy Spirit. If you get this wrong, you've, mis you've misunderstood the Holy Spirit. He, verse 14, will glorify me. 
Jesus says. The Spirit will glorify Jesus. The Holy Spirit was not sent to build up a body of the Spirit, but to build up the body of Christ, to glorify, that is to beautify, to uh, show the excellence of, to show the weightiness of, to show the importance of, to shine the spotlight on Jesus. J.I. Packer, anything J.I. Packer writes is worth reading. And J.I. Packer likens the Holy Spirit to floodlights. So if you go down to downtown Nashville at night and you take a look at Bridgestone Arena, it will be lit up right? And Bridgestone Arena, where the Predators play hockey, has this kind of metal hat on it. It's, I think it's architecturally not useful at all. Nobody sits in it, it, but it looks amazing. And you looking at Bridgestone Arena, you're going to think, that's impressive. But you're, what's not going to come into your mind to think is, you know, the lighting on this building is just extraordinary. You're going to think to yourself, the architecture on this building is extraordinary. And the reason that thought's going to come into your mind is because of the way that it's lit up. Guys, the Holy Spirit lights up Jesus in our eyes. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't make Jesus more impressive than he already is. The Holy Spirit gives us the eyes to see Jesus and exalts Jesus in view of the world so that we are wowed. The Holy Spirit, in other words, is self-effacing and Christ exalting. John Stott speaks of the Holy Spirit as a shy spirit. Self-effacing, Christ exalting, and guys, anyone who is filled with the Holy Spirit will be, by virtue of the Spirit's ministry, self-effacing and Christ exalting, or else they are not filled with the Holy Spirit. The mark of being filled with the Spirit is that we join with the Spirit in exalting Jesus. So if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if you want to be as filled with the Holy Spirit as the apostles, give yourself humbly to knowing Jesus and to exalting Jesus and to building out the cause of Christ on earth through his church and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit because that's what the Holy Spirit is here to do. Since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, the Apostle Paul says. Now when we hear that phrase, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, what comes into our minds next? I mean, is it, you know, journal regularly or, um, I don't know, uh, you know, Uh, you know, sing more worship songs. Here's what Paul says. Since you are eager for manifestations, that is, you know, outworkings, or, or, or since you want to be filled with the Spirit, since you want to see the Spirit really work and move, therefore, strive to excel in building up the church. Why? Because the church is the body of Christ on earth. The church is where Jesus is exalted. As Pastor Ray prayed, we see that it is possible for a whole nation to to be focused in one direction. The, The turmoil that you know, we wish didn't exist because we don't want to live in this inside of this kind of turmoil and drama, but it has showed us that. We as a nation have the capacity of focusing in one direction. And when we pray for the exaltation of Jesus in the world, what we are really praying is that the world would look like the church because the church is where Jesus is the issue. The church is where Jesus in all of his beauty and wisdom and depth is put on display and we are all adjusting to him and marveling at him and enjoying him together. You can't even be a good church if you don't enjoy Jesus because he's the whole point. If we want to be swept up into the purposes of God, if we want to live the life that the Bible says is truly life, then we really do want to partner with the Holy Spirit and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Some of us, the category we have for the Holy Spirit is so weird that we think to ourselves, what respectable person would ever want to be filled with the Spirit? This makes you do weird stuff. 
Well, that's not the way the Spirit is in the Bible. The Spirit dignifies. I'm going to make up a word. This is so Ray Ortland for me to do this. The Spirit seriousizes us. People who are filled with the Holy Spirit take themselves seriously because they know they are partnering with God in the only cause that will matter a billion years from now. They don't trivialize themselves. They're not swept away with, you know, flights of emotion as if that were somehow an evidence that God is in them. They're people of purpose. They don't They're not afraid to be emotional, but they live with a sincere purpose, the glory of Jesus. For instance, for years, I thought that Kirby Lang was an academic because there were so many academic chairs and scholarships and grants and things named after him in the divinity schools in the UK. But as it turns out, Kirby Lang owned one of the largest construction companies in the UK, died in 2009. He was an evangelical Christian who poured his life into the building up of God's church on earth. And so even now at the University of Aberdeen, where I recently graduated, there's the Kirby Lang, you know, chair of divinity. Why? Because he knew that his company and his knowledge and his wealth existed for the glory of Jesus and he partnered with the Holy Spirit and he plowed himself into the kingdom of God. Would to God that there were more Kirby Langs in the world. Men and women who think and genuinely believe they can move the needle for Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is Christ-centered in his ministry, and that Christ-centeredness plays itself out in two related, these are not separate, these are part of the same ministry, two related categories, conviction of the world and guidance of the church. So this is 1.1. The Spirit convicts the world, therefore we have hope for the world. Look at verses 8 to 11. And when he, that is the Spirit, comes, he will what? He will convict the world. This is courtroom language. The language here is is, is trial language. It's as if if Jesus, by his earthly ministry, his life, his perfect life, his atoning death, his triumphant resurrection from the dead, has put the world on trial. Trial. And the Holy Spirit comes as God's prosecutor. Now, you might think that's bad news, but it's good news because the Holy Spirit is not prosecuting us into a lifelong sentence of death, but into a sentence of life. In other words, the Holy Spirit means to bring conviction upon our hearts so that we make a plea deal with Jesus. Friends, (laughs) conviction of sin is a mercy from God. What if you didn't feel it? What if you had no sense of your sin? What if you were like Judas? A sense of conviction of sin makes us say with the hymn writer, foul I to the mountain fly, fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. If we're to be washed of our sins, we have to have a true sense of our neediness. We're all, all, all right? So we're not here, the church, looking out at the world, judging. We're identifying with the sinful tendencies we see in the world because, guys, Those tendencies are deep inside of us all because of sin. We're all like counterfeit bills. 
And it's not until we, we're put up against the real thing in Jesus Christ that we can even recognize our own fraudulence in the mirror of Jesus Christ. So that's why I said that these two ministries are related ministries, the conviction of the world and the guidance of the church. In other words, those who are being guided from the world into the truth are just those who have felt the conviction of sin by the power of the Holy Spirit and have turned from their sin to Jesus for cleansing. We do not embrace the truth without a sense of our need. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of my favorite uh, preachers, British preacher, um, um, uh, 20th century preacher, died in the 80s. And um, he was a thundering preacher from the pulpit. And after a sermon one day, he he was uh, sitting at the front of the church, you know, sitting just down here uh, um, below the pulpit. And a little girl came up to him. And he was a gentle man, despite the fact that he was a thundering preacher. And kids loved Martin Lloyd-Jones. And she came up to him and she said to him, you know, I'm not a Christian. (laughs) And he said to her, well, you know, knowing you're not a Christian is halfway to becoming one. Would that more people in the South today had enough awareness to be even halfway there. Jonathan Edwards checks us in our zeal for other people's awareness of their sin. He says, spiritual pride causes one to speak of other person's sins their enmity against God and his people, or with laughter and levity and an air of contempt. While pure Christian humility disposes either to be silent about them or to speak of them with grief or pity. The spiritually proud person shows it in his finding fault with other saints, that they are low in grace and how cold and dead they are and are quick to discern and take notice of their deficiencies. The eminently humble Christian has so much to do at home and sees so much evil in his own heart that he is not apt to be very busy with other hearts. As a sense of the vileness of our hearts is an evidence of the Spirit's presence in our lives. Here's the point. It's meant to lead us deeper into the heart of Christ. Let's notice something about the Spirit's conviction. The Spirit's conviction is not stone throwing. It's not conviction for the sake of conviction. It's conviction for the sake of knowing Christ. Look at what Jesus says in verse nine. Concerning sin, why? Because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, why? Because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. In other words, because Jesus has been proven righteous by the fact that he has ascended to the highest station possible, the very right hand of God. Concerning judgment, why? Because the ruler of this world is judged. Guys, here's the difference between the conviction of the Holy Spirit and between the accusations of Satan. Satan comes to us and he says to us, you did this. Therefore, you can never be accepted by God. You're not a real Christian. A real Christian doesn't do that. You're a traitor. The Holy Spirit comes to us and he says, Christ did this. You don't have to live in your sin. You don't have to live in unrighteousness. You don't have to be judged along with the ruler of this world. Come out from the world. Be separate. Christ has done it all. He does bring conviction for sin, specific, real, weighty, sometimes, guys, 
under the weight of sin, we groan. I don't worry about the person who comes into my office overcome with the weight of their sin. I worry about the person who comes in my office flippant about their sin. Because, guys, the weightiness drives us deeper into the heart of Christ if we will turn to him. That's what only the Holy Spirit can do. Now, I wanna add quickly that some of us right now are deeply frustrated because we have been trying in the power of the flesh to bring about a sense of conviction in those that we love, or at least that we think we love. Maybe it's a wayward child a self-deceived friend, whoever it might be. And we have found that we are powerless to make them feel their sin. Why? Because we are not the prosecutor. We are the witness. Our job is to take the witness stand and to bear witness to Jesus Christ in the world. It's the Holy Spirit's job to take our witness and make it land with great effect in the courtroom of men's hearts. We do our job when we preach Christ. When our pleading is Christ-centered, then we're firing arrows that the Holy Spirit can guide into men's hearts. Guys, one sentence spoken about Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit is 10,000 more times likely to take root in the soil of our neighbor's heart and bring about a harvest of righteousness than 10,000 sentences aimed at pulling out the weeds of their sin. We have to unleash Christ in the world if we want to see Christ work. Men of Israel, Peter says, the first sermon ever preached on the day of Pentecost. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. All right? Jesus is the subject of the preaching that injected humaneness into the world. Jesus is the only subject that can command the attention of the entire world and actually at the same time change things. The Spirit of God needs nothing more than the gospel of Jesus Christ to usher in the next great awakening, which is why the most relevant thing we have to offer the world today is not our witty tweets or our Instagram lectures, but our openness to the Spirit of God as we bear witness to Jesus Christ. That is why, guys, you matter more than you know. That's why it matters the way that you speak and the way that you act and the things that you sign on to. You're an ambassador for Christ. I wish I had the words to help us all take ourselves more seriously. To treat ourselves with the dignity that we've been given in Christ Jesus. Your voice matters. Your witness matters. Because Christ is in you. Is there a racist, so racist, a person so bitter, a child so wayward, a friend so deceived, a country so crooked that the Spirit of God can't set them straight? May we never dishonor God with such a low estimation of his power. 1.2, the Holy Spirit guides us into all the truth. Verse 12 and 15, therefore, we can move forward in confidence. Verses 12 to 15, look at it with me. This is the third he will. I still have many things to say to you. But, when, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he has come, he will guide you into all the truth. This is all of our comfort this morning. I spent the better half of last week asking the Lord to show me the way forward as the lead pastor of Emmanuel Nashville. 
I think I'm probably not alone in wondering, what do I do? In response to all that is happening, what do I do? And I'm happy to say that I've found courage in this promise. He will guide you. Now, in its context, this verse speaks to how our New Testament scriptures came to be. The apostles um, didn't walk around with pen and paper jotting down everything that Jesus did. A mere biography of Jesus is not what we have in the New Testament. What we have is the is the actual explanation of Jesus. And they didn't truly understand Jesus until the sending down of the Holy Spirit. Then they were ready to bear witness to Jesus. But in our context, this verse explains how the Spirit of God in every generation guides us into a discovery of the knowledge of Jesus through the writings of the apostles. And it's in this way that, guys, we are not inferior to the apostles. The Spirit is no less able to enlighten our minds through Scripture than He was to enlighten their hearts in the writing of Scripture. We are not at a disadvantage. As a matter of fact, we stand on the shoulders of everyone who's come before us. I can sit down in my office, I can read John 3.16, and I can say to myself, I wonder what John Newton saw when he read John 3.16. I take John Newton off the shelf, and he tells me. We are in a privileged position Not only do we have the Bible, we have the writings of loads and loads and the the lived witness of loads and loads of Christians who have come before us to cheer us on as we run our leg of the race. So maybe our leg is more complicated. Maybe modernism and technologicalization and secularism is harder than the first century faced into. So what? We've got more to work with. That wasn't in my manuscript. I don't know where I'm at. The Spirit, says Spurgeon, is like a tour guide into the cave of wonders that is Jesus Christ. Guys, you can go deeper with Jesus than you think because Jesus is deeper than you think. And the Spirit shines the light on Jesus in just the place that we need to be amazed by him. He guides us into discoveries of the wisdom of Jesus Christ so that we know what to do, so that we know how to glorify him. We need new discoveries of Jesus today. And we're mistaken if we think that by simply knowing our Bibles, we will have the light of the Holy Spirit there's a not humble way to read your Bible. There's a way to use the Bible to keep Jesus at arm's length. That's what the Pharisees did. John chapter five and verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me. It's possible for Jesus to be standing right in front of us and we don't even recognize him. We need the light of the Holy Spirit. We're oblivious to God without the illumination of the Spirit, without the guidance, without the Spirit taking us by the hand and walking us into believing views of Jesus. There's an instance that comes to us from Christian history that wonderfully demonstrates the point. The the Westminster Confession of Faith of 1646 was the result of, I think, 120 scholars, biblical, not scholars, not just scholars, scholars and pastors coming together and thinking through what a robust statement of the Christian faith looks like. It's hard to imagine there's ever been a greater collection of theological minds than there was at the Westminster Assembly. No small amount of debate went into the writing of it. There was then, as there is now, tension between the state and the church. At one point in their meetings, it was said that a line of reasoning was being put forward by a very capable scholar by the name of John Selden, which was more a nod to the state than to Jesus. While Selden spoke, a man named George Gillespie is said to have been scribbling down notes furiously upon a small piece of paper 
After Selden finished, Gillespie stood up and delivered what men at the time regarded as one of the finest biblical arguments of rebuttal that, ha- that, would ha- that has ever been given. John Selden spoke, I think, for a long time. Uh, Gillespie spoke for a short amount of time with seven clear lines of reasoning dismantling Selden's arguments. And John Selden is said to, it was, it was overheard to have said that Gillespie swept away the labor of 10 years of his life in that one moment. I think it's funny. Um, afterwards, here's, here's the point I'm driving at. The piece of paper upon which Gillespie was writing so furiously um, was said to contain this phrase, this prayer, repeated over and over. More light, Lord. More light, Lord. More light, Lord. More light. I love that. What possessed Gillespie to scribble that prayer over and over rather than take down notes? He knew that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. The point here, friends, is not what we can do for Jesus but what Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can do for us, in us, and through us. We have it on the authority of Jesus right here in this promise that the mission of the Holy Spirit is to connect us to all that the Father has. The question that you face this morning is not, what about my weakness? What about my small sphere of influence? What about the problems in the world? The question that you face is, is the Holy Spirit still the Holy Spirit? Has the Holy Spirit abandoned his post? Is God still God? If so, then we are living in the days of his power. And we have no right before God to settle for less than the filling of the Holy Spirit. So I don't know any other way to end this sermon than to go to prayer and to give everyone here an opportunity to open their heart to Jesus and to humbly receive whatever measure of the Spirit God is willing to give to you right now. We've been praying for the fullness of the Holy Spirit for some time. (laughs) And we're not gonna stop because There's a verse in Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 8 that says, give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in all the earth. So we're going to go to prayer again. We're going to ask God again to pour out his Holy Spirit because he put that verse in the Bible. He is saying to us, give me no rest. So I'll begin and we'll have a time of silence for you to pray and then I'll close us. Father, you know how to break through to us. You know how, Father, to fill weak, tired, just downright exhausted sinners full of the Holy Spirit and to do great and mighty things through many or through few because you're God. So we're not here, Father, to say to you it should go this certain way. We're just here to say to you we are open to you. We are taking you at your word 
Everything about what we're doing is in your hands, at your disposal. Change what you want. Lead in whatever way you want. Only, Father, send down the Holy Spirit in great power. Father, I want to close by asking that you would pull us into reality with Jesus as never before. So that we don't trivialize ourselves and insult your grace and grieve your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.